All right, and welcome back to another episode of Life Changing Challengers. As always, I'm your host, Brad Minus, and today, very honored to have Jonathan Tudor with us. He's an author, he's an executive coach, he's a management consulting, and he owns his own management firm, Triple P. And there is a big story behind that. I am uh, super excited. And Jonathan has this amazing story. And we're going to dive in right now. Jonathan, as I ask my guests every single time, can you tell us a little bit about your childhood, the compliment of your family, how where you grew up, and what it was like to be Jonathan as a kid? Yeah, at a bit of a, I'd say, interesting childhood. I am one of four children and Three of us are triplets, so that's a fascinating dynamic all by itself. And most people then wonder, well, is your other sibling who has a brother the younger or older? And my response to that always is there are very few people that I think would willingly have children after having triplets, so he's older. (laughs) I grew up in the Philadelphia suburbs, pretty what I would call normal middle-class life, parents extremely supportive both with their own careers. My mom later in life with her own career, but we were as children, uh, very close, particularly my triplet siblings, just by nature of sharing a womb for that long, had that additional connection. But yeah, it means great childhood, pretty much anything that I ever could have wanted or expected. Any sports, extracurricular stuff that you really enjoyed? I played a lot of tennis. It wasn't, wasn't, the greatest tennis player, but I, you know, I played in some to- some tournaments outside of high school tennis. And uh, my triplet brother and my sister played in college, so they were more of the athletes than I was. One of my one of my favorite stories as a little kid, which my dad told me when I was much older, was when we were throwing the baseball around and in the backyard. He said at one point he thought I was hopeless. So. If that gives you a sense for my athletic talents. So sports, I did my best, but I wasn't the most athletic. I played the piano for a little bit. Nothing else really from an extracurricular standpoint. What did your dad do? My dad actually just recently retired. He is a public finance attorney. So he does a lot of municipal bond deals and that sort of thing. Very technical stuff. But I just re- recently retired, although he's still doing a little bit of work on the side, but always interesting to listen to him talk about his work at the dinner table, I, although I still don't fully understand it, but <laughs> it does. Yeah. It doesn't sound like it could be all that exciting municipal bonds and stuff, but you know what? If your dad can make it sound exciting, uh, good for him. That's cool. So were you, did you excel in high school? Did you do any extracurriculars in high school? Yeah, high school, high school did did well. In fact, an interesting side story. I just reconnected with my eleventh grade English teacher, who was my. She's actually in my acknowledgments in my book. Just however many years later, she had that much of an impact on me. So really lucky to have a couple of really phenomenal teachers in high school. As I mentioned, I played tennis in high school. That was my main extracurricular. Played a little bit of piano, that sort of thing, but and a big, huge Philadelphia sports fan. I, I must, I got to throw that out there too for for your Philadelphia uh, fans that are listening. That's exactly what I was about to ask. I was about to say Eagles fan, and that's cool. And I, I've I've now lived in the DC area longer than I lived in Philadelphia. But once once the Philadelphia sports in your blood, they, they you, you can't let them go. I hear you. I, like I said, grew up in Chicago and I've been away from Chicago longer than I lived there. And I'm still going to be a Chicago Bear fan, whether they're win or lo- whether they win or lose and more lose than not. So, but that's a whole different story. As long as you're not one of the, as long as you're not the stereotypical Philadelphia fan, I'm good with you. I was waiting for you to bring that up. Yeah. No, that's not me, but yeah, there are quite a few interesting fans out there for sure. Yeah. Unfortunately. So what did you, so I'm assuming you went to school, you went to college. Yes. Where'd you go to school? George Washington University uh, in DC. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. And what you studied, I'm sure, what, did you get business administration? I did. Yeah. I had a, a BBA, double major in information systems and human resources with a minor in psychology. Oh, so not too much of a workload, just. Just hung out, partied, and did your schoolwork. That was it, right? Yep. yep. George Washington University, top tier school, just underneath Ivy League, ne- next to Ivy League school. So yeah, I can imagine. So what did you end up? What did you end up doing right after school? 
So when I was, one of the great things about going to college in Washington, D.C. is, and one of the reasons why I chose GW is just the access to opportunities for work. There's just so much in, in our backyard here. Uh, and so I ended up getting an internship with uh, KPMG Consulting my junior year in college and really loved the consulting work. And when I graduated in 1999, if you recall, that was the, the dot-com boom where if you had a pulse, you were getting multiple job offers. Right. But I, I decided to, to stay with uh, KPMG Consulting and then moved on to Accenture for about 12 years. But I really enjoyed the consulting work. I was able to get that great experience during college. So then after graduation, it was, again, my pick of what I wanted to do next. That's amazing. Uh, that's amazing. Yeah. So I, a lot of people don't know this. So, and I tend to save a couple of little anecdotes for myself through these episodes. So I'm not giving it all away one at one time, but my day job is once I got out of the military, my day job is I'm a, I'm an IT project manager. And throughout my course of time when I, and I've been a consultant basically the whole time, it's just basically anywhere from three months to three years, I've stayed on a project. And I've worked and hired KPMG and Accenture for certain things that I've done. When I worked for JP, J, uh, um, JP Morgan, I hired Accenture. So yeah, so yeah, so small world, a little bit of a good parallel there. Yep. So, all right, so let's get into the meat. Something happened around what, age 30? Yes. Yeah. Again, as a, a lot of people ask me, what was life like before this life-changing event? And as I look back on it, again, I, I, I hesitate to use the word normal because that has so many different meanings to it, but it pretty much was. And I was working, I was at Accenture at the time, but I was working in my studio apartment in Woodley Park late at night, as I typically did back then. I was working easily 80 plus hours a week. And next thing I know, I'm waking up slumped over on my bed, which abutted my desk. And I had no idea what happened. I shrugged it off to, I somehow fell asleep, which was very odd for me. I, I didn't typically fall asleep while working, even if it was late at night. So I just got in bed, slept it off, woke up early to finish my work, went to the client site the next day, which was in Arlington, Virginia with the state department and i was in a meeting with my client counterpart and we're talking and the next thing i know i'm waking up in the ER. and as they described to me what my client saw what he said was john was talking his eyes rolled back in his head his head hit the desk he fell down on the floor and shook a little bit that was the description and the ER did the blood work and other tests. Everything was normal. And we at the time chalked it up to sometimes the body does strange things and needs to reboot. Right. I, I certainly didn't have any idea that it was anything serious, even with what had happened the night before. Right. So now there's two events that are anomalies. About a month or two later, I was traveling to Ottawa, Canada with the state department. I was in a, in a meeting at the U S embassy there. And again, next thing I know, I'm waking up in ER in Ottawa and the doctor walks in and says to me pretty brusquely based on the account that was described to us. And some of the previous events, you have epilepsy, here's Dilantin and walked out of the room. And is that just the way they are in Canada? It's just abrupt. Hey, you got ap epilepsy. Here's your medication. I'm out. I'm sorry for your Canadian listeners. That that was just my, my experience in that Ottawa ER. And it's, and I, I can't speak to all the Canadian hospitals, but I, and my mind was just racing, and I, I couldn't even utter a word before he left. Right? Like I, I had just so many questions. Wait, epilepsy? Wait, what? I'm just going to take medication now? Like what? So my boss got a call from the Accenture security operations team, which is the, the group that monitors any uh, Accenture people that were traveling overseas. Um, so we were on a project that was putting people all over the world all the time. Um, so she would get phone calls from them 
frequently. And the, the crazy story there is they called her uh, and told her that, quote, John Tudor passed away um, when they meant passed out. Away and out changes the meaning of that sentence significantly. Canada have a different language. Is there something? Are we missing something here? Yeah, exactly. I, I didn't make light of it, but I, I get it. Man, I can't. I just can't imagine. And all that these. So we've talked about three different times, and you have no recollection of anything, of any of it. No. And did you, when you woke up in the ER both times, did you? feel anything different was it a headache were you like were you nauseous i was sore in parts of my body that i I typically wasn't sore that that was probably the biggest difference and i felt i felt a little foggy but it's still i I, at that point i still was very unsure of this diagnosis it just seemed way too quick with very limited information and Quite frankly, I didn't know much about epilepsy at that point, like many people don't. Epilepsy, at the time, I thought, okay, grand mal seizure. That's not even the the medical term for it anymore. It's not referred to as a tonic-clonic seizure. But yeah, just, what? what? Yeah. So when my boss got the phone call, she called my colleague who was with me and confirmed, no, John's alive. He's just, he passed out. So we got that cleared up. She then called my parents, who then called my brother, because they were both traveling for work. And my brother got on a plane from D.C. out to Ottawa and came to the ER and took me back to D.C. on the next flight out. And then soon after, uh, I went to see a couple different neurologists and decided on one who I really liked a lot. We just connected well. She seemed to care about my case. And I asked her, I said, why Dilantin? Because that was not one of the drugs that she was recommending. And she was pretty direct about the fact that, yeah, I don't really prescribe that anymore. Dilantin was the first anti-seizure medication that came to market. And there've been many medications since that have surpassed it. So that, that was a little bit frustrating too. It's like, well, okay, first you don't even give me a chance to ask you questions. Then you give me medication that a lot of people aren't even prescribing anymore. What's going on here? So just a lot of stuff at this point. There's so much confusion and uncertainty. She didn't directly diagnose me with epilepsy at that point, but based on everything that I described to her, she said it's very unlikely. It's very likely that's, you know, that's what we're dealing with. And let's just continue to monitor it. I, over the next couple of years, I continue to have seizures on a, I wouldn't say a frequent basis, but on enough frequency where we had to, to play with the medication a little bit. And then I hit a, a period of time where, for a number of years, I was seizure-free. Oh, nice. The medication was working. Maybe lifestyle had something to do with it. But I started doing some research, and there's actually a fair amount of people that, quote-unquote, outgrow their epilepsy. And I thought, okay, maybe that's me. Maybe I'm one of those lucky ones. And then right around the time when my first daughter was born, the seizures came back and the frequency picked up significantly. Of course, that was also around the time that I left my um, consulting career to start my new business and to become, to pivot my career, become an executive coach and all that. So there are a lot of things going on that were stressful, but that's when things got really challenging for me. It was a lab rat game, so much trial and error, nothing really working. And it just the seizure frequency was starting to get really challenging. Some days, four or five seizures a, a day. Um, oh my god, I I can't even fathom that. I've had because of sickness and stuff. I've been through it, it's a seizure, but and it's I wouldn't I wouldn't want my worst enemy to go through that, let alone you or anybody else. And to do four or five a day, I can't even imagine. Can I just step back real quick? Yes. When you first started talking to your doctor, did she give you, just to give a little bit of education of what exactly epilepsy is? Yeah, it's multiple seizures is within a period of time. So it's really not any more complicated than that. And there are, there, here's where it gets complicated. There are over 30 different types of seizures. So again, I mentioned before. Many people just assume epilepsy is grand mal seizures. You lose consciousness, fall to the ground, and shake. 
Well, that's just one of many different types of seizures. I will tell you, so I've had over 500 seizures since I was 30, and the vast majority of those are not grand mal or tonic-clonic seizures. I've had plenty of those, but the majority of them are what's called uh, focal aware seizures. And this is where it gets gets a little bit interesting and where most people, wow, really, that's actually what happens. So a focal aware seizure is where I'm aware of it going on. Like I could be having a focal aware seizure right now and have a conversation with you. But in my head, and I write about this in my book, it's like there's a movie playing. The first thing that happens is there's this awful smell. And I, I really try hard to describe that smell. And it took a really long time to, to do that in the book. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to recreate that for you now. Just think about one of the worst smells you've ever smelled. Okay. That's what it is. Creates a lot of nausea. And as I mentioned, this movie playing in my head, at first I talked about it like it was deja vu because it was, a, it's, it's a scene from my life that I've experienced before i've been there as i started to research it more it's really a closer definition is is a flashback it's a flashback to a point in time and it would be the same five to ten movies or scenes from my life that would play out in my head while this is as part of the seizure and i would get really sweaty on my hairline on my back and then the scene would end the movie would end and then it would be over I never actually timed one. A lot of people will ask me, well, how long do they last? Because I'm not going to stop and time it while it's happening because it's unpleasant. But if I had to guess no more than a couple minutes tops, aftermath is, again, a lot of, so the nausea takes some time to abate. The perspiration takes time to, takes time to cool off. And then it's, it really leaves me with a dullness. The analogy I use in the book is it's like trying to write with a dull pencil where the lines, the lines are just not crisp. So sometimes, you know, if you write with a dull pencil, it's hard to read your own handwriting. That's what it feels like. Tasks that were simple before become more challenging. So that the best way for me to describe a focal aware seizure, many people are just are surprised that, wow, that's actually what happens. Cause again, you don't, it, it's completely invisible to the outside world you wouldn't know it. And there are other types of seizures that, that are like that. So anyway. Wow. So you said the tetaclonic? Tonic clonic. Tonic clonic, grandma. That's a basically you're basically fall unconscious and you've got mus muscular trembling and then, well, convulsing basically. And then the, the, so the focal aware is that you have, you've got something Totally different than what you've been thinking about going on inside your head. Anna cubes get sweaty. The rest of you get sweaty, but then that's only a couple of minutes and then you're back. Yeah. So, all right. So just, just wanted to, just want to clarify that. So if anybody out there is feeling something that maybe you should think about going to see a neurologist, was there, is there any other types of surgeries you can, or not surgeries, seizures that you can tell us about? Yeah. So there are focal unaware seizures. So similar to what I described in the focal aware seizure, except you wouldn't be able to have a conversation. Okay. You're just, your mind is shut off at that point or your body kind of shuts off. There are seizures where people will blurt things out that they don't even know they're saying, or they might have some strange muscle movements, but they're otherwise conscious. They just don't remember. And there's, again, there's so many different ones, but it just, so much more than just what people typically think of as a tonic clonic or grand mal seizure. Oh, that's amazing. So, so you're starting to get, you're starting to get four or five of these a day. What was the, what was your conversations like with your doctor? Yeah, I was, that's pretty frustrated, right? Oh, and COVID hit during this time of events. I, I think that was probably the biggest aha for me was okay, epilepsy has been around since the biblical times, and yet we're still playing the trial and error game. And that to me speaks to, again, I don't want to go down this rabbit hole too far, but if you look at how much funding epilepsy receives versus many other diseases, it's just severely underfunded. So unfortunately, that is a big part of it. Now, 
recently there have been some major breakthroughs from a technology standpoint, a surgical standpoint, medication standpoint, but also at the same time, the brain is the most complicated organ in the body. So there's still so much we don't know about it. But yeah, it was, you know, one, one appointment would be, okay, well, let's, let's up your dosage of Lamictal. Okay. That didn't work. Okay. Let's pair it with Depakote. Oh, that didn't work. Let's pair it with blah, blah, blah. Oh, that didn't work. How about you take some vitamin D? Oh, that didn't work. Let's, right. And it just, like, there's gotta be something better. Yeah. It's like throwing spaghetti at the wall and see which one of them sticks. Yeah. That's horrible. That I can't even imagine going through that. Just trying something out oh, that didn't work. Trying something that didn't work. That's going to be so frustrating. Yeah. Then I, so I was at an epilepsy foundation walk and was there with a friend who asked me how I was doing. And I typically don't like to talk about the bad things that are going on, but we were at the epilepsy walk. So I figured I would share with him. And he said he had a good friend who was a neurologist at the University of Pennsylvania, which happens to be where I'm from. And we got connected. Philadelphia is a little bit too far to to go from DC uh, for you know regular appointments. So she put me in touch with a doctor at a neurologist at Johns Hopkins, and that sort of put me on the path to the next phase of all of this, which was surgery, <laughs> which I never thought I would ever consider or would ever even be a possibility. But that ultimately was after many other tests. What happened next? What were they, I, I hate to say it in such a layman term, but what were they doing in there? Yeah. So the first two, so there so three surgeries, three brain surgeries. The first two were part of a procedure called a stereo EEG. So a lot of people know an EEG, a regular EEG is just where they put electrodes on your scalp and then monitor you, monitor the electrical activity in your brain and then hopefully you have a seizure and they can, the doctors can pinpoint the origin of those seizures or the seizure onset zone. As I like to say, unfortunately, when we don't want to have seizures, we have seizures. When we want to have seizures, we don't. And so for the, for a very long period of time, and I had many EEGs, I just never had a, a seizure while hooked up to waters. They take the electrodes off, you have a seizure, right? Mm. <laughs> right. The stereo EEG was as my neurologist was explaining to me before we did it, it was pretty invasive. So what they do is they drill holes in your head and then they thread the electrodes, electrodes through the holes and implant them into the different parts of the brain where they think this seizure onset zone might be. And the point is that the electrodes being implanted in the brain as opposed to on the scalp, are just going to be that much more um, and be able to pinpoint exactly where their biggest concern, and I appreciate this, is we're not going to do any kind of resection or anything to your brain surgically without knowing with 100% certainty that this is your, this is the zone, right? Because that could cause many other issues. So I was scheduled to be in the hospital for a week of, for this SEEG. One week went by, no seizures. They said, hey, can you stay for another week? Okay. Second week went by, no seizures. Hey, can you stay for a third week? Okay. By the end of the third week, they asked me to stay for a fourth week, and that was my breaking point. I said, listen, I have two little kids at home. I have a job. I have a wife. I, I just can't. I can't stay here for another week. And so my neurologist said to me, okay, well, we can induce a seizure through electrical stimulation. And the morning... Um, when he was the morning of the electrical stimulation, he was walking into the room and I had a natural seizure and they were able to confirm their hypothesis, um, which was the seizure, seizures were originating from my non-dominant hippocampus. And so we didn't have to do the electrical stimulation, which still to this day scares me a little bit. <laughs> and I wonder if the stress from thinking about it maybe contributed to the to having the natural seizure. But yeah, that was quite quite the experience. I can't even imagine that. But so that whole first procedure, you had three brain surgeries. And the first one, which you said was invasive, was purely diagnostic. Yeah. yeah. Wow. That's just crazy to think about. You're drilling a hole in your brain just so they can put electrodes in so they can monitor your... And then that's all freaking just diagnostic. It had nothing to do. Oh, wow. That's crazy. So they isolated the non-dominant hippocampus and 
then what, what were they able to do with that? They use medication. Do they give you another surgery? So throughout all of this is talked about the different options, depending upon what the seizure onset zone was different medication was a potential option. Um, that was one thing that I really appreciated about my neurologist at, at Hopkins is they said, listen, we're not going to change anything about your medication regimen or any anything about your treatment plan until we know exactly where your seizures are originating from. It could have been medication, but there were multiple surgeries and other devices that could have been options. Uh, but ultimately with it being my non-dominant hippocampus, I was a candidate for what's called laser ablation surgery, where they drill another hole. So total of 15 holes for those of you counting. They insert laser fiber through that hole and then literally burn or ablate that part of the brain so that my non-dominant hippocampus. They do all of this through robotics and following M MRI images. It's really high tech now. The concern is that if it gets too hot, that it could ablate. If the laser gets too hot, it could ablate other regions surrounding that, which could result in some other pretty, pretty scary side effects. Uh, I'll, I'll never forget the, the legal paperwork I had to sign before, before all of these procedures, but particularly before the laser ablation surgery. Yeah. The, the risks that were associated with it, stroke, bleeding, death, going blind. There were a lot of possibilities. Thankfully, none of that happened, but yeah, quite, quite the interesting experience. My, my neurosurgeon was phenomenal. I had, he walked me through the procedure before we did it. And as anybody who's seen Jerry Maguire, he, he had me at hello. <laughs> he was okay. So when you were signing this paperwork, did you ever, did it cross your mind ever to think, heck, I'll just live with the seizures? Maybe for a brief moment, but the thing that I kept coming back to was I want to be able to live my best life for me, for my family, for my kids, for anyone in my life. And having seizures so regularly was, was getting in the way of that. And one thing I didn't mention, the catalyst for actually going ahead with the laser ablation surgery, because it was recommended, but it wasn't like you have to do this or else. I could have lived with uncontrolled seizures. My older daughter, who at the time was about three years old, I was taking a nap. And she walked into my room and saw me having a tonic clonic seizure and three years old or at any age, really, it's frightening to see anyone just shaking uncontrollably, making noises with my mouth that were really unsettling that as my wife described it later, you couldn't tell if it, if I was just parched or if I was struggling to breathe. It was just a really frightening sight for her. And she just kept saying to my wife, tell daddy to stop, tell daddy to stop, tell daddy to stop. Until she finally had to take her out of the room. My wife had to take her out of the room because that's just, it's too scary for a three-year-old to watch. And she, she talked about it for a little bit after, but thankfully her three-year-old brain let her move on. But my, my thought process was it's one thing for me to experience seizures and have them impact me, but if they're going to impact my family, particularly my kids, I, I really have to do something about it. And that's what pulled me over the edge about agreeing to sign the paperwork of, yeah, you could die from this procedure. <laughs> I, I can see that obviously when you have a family, it's thing, things become bigger than yourself. And obviously that's what you, that's what you were thinking about at the time. So how did that turn out? Yeah, it went, it went as planned as they say, the recovery time was actually fairly short. It was a couple of days in the hospital soon after for the next number of week months really actually many months I, I was not myself i was extremely exhausted just very low energy i would randomly fall asleep in the middle of the day i just it just wasn't me and my wife who is very attuned to to me and my personality just one day came to me and she said this isn't you we need to do something about this i went back to hopkins they did some more tests and many more test procedures. We did T scans, MRIs, you name it. Um, and everything seemed normal, which is good and bad. And then my wife, as this continued after I got back from Hopkins, said to me, I think you're depressed. You haven't smiled in a week. And that, that sort of knocked me, knocked me over. I have definitely dealt with a lot of 
negative stuff in my life like everyone else does, but I've never been, I'd never been depressed before. I didn't really know what that meant or felt like. And I had no other explanation. So I went to see a psychiatrist and he ran me through the, the gamut of um, depression questions and passed with flying colors. So medication for that actually really seemed to help. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it's so interesting because you, you just went through all of these, you went through months and months of where you were doing four to five seizures a day, finally get to a point where you would think the average person would think that, oh my God, he's not, we're not going to say cured because obviously it's, it's too complex for that, but he's gotten to this point where hopefully he's not going to have another seizure or they're going to be tremendously diminished. You should be happy about that. No more scaring your kids. No more and no more worrying about where you're going to be at work or everything like that. You would think that you would be like overjoyed. I started doing research on it. The The percentage of people with epilepsy and depression is significant as compared to the normal population. So so that started to bring it into a little bit more focus for me. But, but you're right. No more seizures, but I also felt awful. And when I went back to Hopkins, I talking to my neurosurgeon about my my symptoms and he said to me you you're just a little bit removed from three four plus hour brain surgeries with a lot of anesthesia and various other medication going through your body this this isn't all that surprising i've had a couple of patients recently that have been through the same thing you have and it's taken them close to a year to feel back to normal and it's a sort of joke, but also somewhat serious about it. I'll never forget. He told me the recovery time is about three weeks. So in my head, I thought, you know, okay, I I'm not going to work for three weeks as much as I really want to, but three weeks, I'm good. When three weeks becomes a year, that's a big difference. Huge. And it really did. It took every bit of a year, if not even a little bit more before I really felt back to myself. So a lot of people say to me, well, if you knew that it was going to be a full year, would you have gone through with all this? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it's better you didn't tell me. I'm not sure I would have, uh, I would be quite honest. Did you, any, did you have any seizures during that year? So as I'm waking up in a post-op post, post -op after the, the laser ablation surgery, the nurses are putting me onto a gurney and... I start to have a, a focal aware seizure. So the same, the nausea, the movie playing, the scene, the perspiration. And then over the next hour or so, I had 10 of these. They just kept the term, the medical term is clustering. So they, it was just a cluster of 10, 10 or so of these focal aware seizures and talk about depression or despondent. I just had this four plus hour procedure where I signed away my life that was supposed to end all of my seizures. And as soon as I wake up, I'm having them over and over again. What? <laughs> yeah. And so the, when the neurologist finally came in, they explained to me that this isn't unexpected. This, I want to say this is normal, but this happens because we're inside your brain poking and prodding and stuff just happens. Now, if this if you continue to experience these seizures over time, certainly that's a problem, but this is it. it. It's okay. And thankfully it was the only other episode that I had, and it'll be, it's about two and a half years since that procedure, since that third surgery, I, we were going to visit family friends for Thanksgiving and I didn't pick up my medication before we left and not taking my medication caused me to have a couple of focal aware seizures. So it's just another reminder of the importance of the medication, but I'll be honest with you. I mean, you, know, you alluded to this, but there was part of me uh, where I thought about, they just ablated my seizure onset zone. My logical mind says, okay, why would I need medication? Why doesn't that, wouldn't the seizures just stop because of the surgery? Uh, and again, the, the brain is just much more complicated than than the simplicity that went through my head there. But um, I, I certainly proved it to myself that that certainly wasn't the case. The hope is, as my neurologist describes it, over time, we can titrate down a little bit. I, I'm on two medications. 
but the likelihood, and maybe go to just one, but the likelihood of ever being off medication entirely is, is just very low. So, so we missed one. So you had the diagnostic, then you had the non-dominant hippocampus laser ablation. What was the third surgery and why? So the SEEG is really two surgeries. So it's oh. implant, it's drilling the holes, implanting the electrodes, and then when it's done, taking electrodes out. So is it surgery? Are they actually doing something, taking something out of my brain? No, but I'm still, there's still four hour plus procedures under general anesthesia and they're going in my brain. So yeah, that sometimes gets confusing, but that will do they are taking something out. It just well, they put something in to start with. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> they just got to go back and take it back out. Yet, but that's wow, right. but that's crazy. So, so okay, so so now it's been two and a half years since you've had a you've had a, a seizure. Uh, two and a half years since the third surgery. Third surgery. It's about a year since the last seizure. Okay, good. And the depression. Yeah, no, I, I'm very happy. No, excellent. Depression. That's what I like to hear. All right. So he was right about the depression. After about a year, it kind of it, it came back. So it, on one side, to me, it didn't really make a lot of sense. But then on the other side, maybe it does. So the hippocampus, if I'm not mistaken, the non-dominant part is memory. And the dominant part is images and visual. Yeah. I think that's right. Yeah. So I didn't get that. So at that part, I didn't get that. Because I was waiting for... I was waiting for the hippocampus, I was thinking about it, and I think I'm thinking of the pituitary gland. I was thinking about that maybe it was something that caused a cortisol level, right? And that was why we got depressed. And I was thinking, oh, well, you were flooded with cortisol throughout the thing. And then, of course, your cortisol falls to nothing. And then, of course, you're definitely going to be depressed. But it really doesn't It doesn't have anything to do with that. So so that's unless it's unless it's, it could be part of that part. I'm not sure. Did they ever come up with an idea of how that just why that happens no and the medication was effective is effective so there's certain things i just left it at that now i'm even more curious but uh, yeah, yeah i really i don't know all right all right but a year you're a year without a seizure that's gotta that's gotta feel amazing yeah and i bet your family is like, just as joyful as you are and business is good yeah yeah, I love what I do. Yeah, it's one of these things. When you're coming out of college, so many people talk about in careers, oh, you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. That was just so hard, such a hard thing to understand. But since I pivoted my career, what, four or five years ago now, something like that, that's honestly how I feel. And it, I, again, it might sound trite, but I pinch myself every morning I wake up and I get to do what I do, which is having a positive impact on people through the executive coaching. I do a lot of facilitation work, organizational offsites and retreats. I teach an emotional intelligence class at the Federal Executive Institute. I do some speaking and of course writing as well. So yeah, I'm just, I'm, I totally found my calling. Just very lucky to have found all this. Uh, that's amazing. And then, yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. If you're doing something that you love, you'll never work a day in your life. I am still not there yet. When I, so I'm an endurance coach as a side hustle and that I love. I coach a car, cross country team. I cross a ta track team. I've got pri private people on my, I've got privates. And when I'm there, yeah, I'm in, in heaven, but unfortunately I still have a nine to five I got to work with. I forgot you're an endurance coach. Can we do a tangent real quick on, on that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I used to run marathon. I've, I've since retired, although I would love to do more. I actually write about this in my book as well, but I, so my goal was to qualify for Boston and I was running the Philadelphia marathon and I missed qualifying by 27 seconds. Oh, geez. Then I ran, it was the DC marathon at the time. I forget what they call it now, but it, it had just started So not Marine Corps. It was actually called the DC yeah. Marathon. Yeah, the Nike uh, DC Marathon, yeah. And I was on pace for a 305 finish, which still left me ridiculous. Five, five minutes or so. And at mile 21, 22, I had a cramp in my calf. I did the hop run thing, and finally my leg just gave out. So there's still some unfinished business for me there. But endurance, that's one of the, one of the areas I love reading about and marathons are one of those 
major endurance yeah. sports for sure. Very cool. Yeah, no, ran Marine Corps was actually my very first marathon. Well, obviously I was living in DC. Question for you though, as far as the marathons go, pre, post, during epilepsy, your absolute your years of being epileptic? Yeah, during, but not not the real challenging times, not the not you know, that area where you were doing 3 to 5 a day. Right. Yeah. Well, and but you didn't go when you got after surgery, you didn't go back to running again. I still run a little bit, but and and I I can't blame it on on the surgery. It's just more life and kids yeah. and commitments. Well, so, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You know what I mean? And it's you're as a marathon runner, you'll get the bug again. Somewhere down the line, you'll get the bug. You'll be maybe you'll be driving down out uh, the Washington Memorial Parkway, and you'll see those guys running on the side. You'll be like, well, I really want to do that again. And it'll happen. And if you want to, give me a call. We'll put a land together for you. Make sure that it, it fits your lifestyle, and we'll knock it out of the park. But, but yeah, that would be that would be amazing. I yeah. So I've done thirty seven marathons, and it's just like yeah. And but my my heart and soul is triathlon. So that's that's where I my heart is. I love coaching triathlon, and of course because triathletes are crazy. Why suck at one sport when you can suck at three? <laughs> So, <laughs> it's where I am with it, but, but yeah, no, that's fantastic. But you, so the, and I might have the wrong URL, but the URL I have has got me to the point where it says that you're, that you are releasing the book and it's going to be called starting over. Yeah, I, I need to, I'm in the process of finalizing a new website. And so I'll, okay. I'll give you that once it's up and running as authors know, um, the book title, book titles tend to change many times as mine has. So yeah, that is, that was a, an older version. The book officially is called seizing today. And the subtitle is discovering purpose and authenticity and a life-changing diagnosis. Nice. I was going to say that. So you had that written on your profile. And I was like, why did he change it? That's such a bunch of, that's such a great title. Why would he change his title? And then I saw the starting over one. I was like, oh no. So I'm glad you're keeping that one. I think that's much, it's a better title. It's more captivating and it'll catch people's attention a little bit more. But so, so it's seizing life seizing uh, today. and seizing today, seizing today. Perfect. I love that. I love the play on words and then the, and then the, the subtitle and say that again for us. Discovering purpose and authenticity in a life-changing diagnosis. Love it. Love it. Seizing today, discovering life and and authenticity in a life-changing diagnosis. Love it. It's going to be great. When do you have a, are we close to a date of release? We're close. So I am, I'm done with the writing again, as other authors listening probably know the book cover design has been the bane of my existence. So we're almost there, but I can't submit or we, the publisher can't submit my files to the printer until the book cover design is done. So I'm really hoping that'll be this week. But if I had to guess publication date at this point, September, I think is realistic. Okay. But I'll certainly let you know once I have an actual pub date. Perfect. So I'm going to get a new, I'm going to get a new URL. I'm not even going to post this one because it's obviously it's out of date. I'm not going to post that one, but I am going to post that his, that Jonathan's business, Triple P Consulting is going to be triple P LLC.co. And I'm going to post that in the show notes. And is there a social media that you spend more time on than another? LinkedIn and my handle is Jonathan Dash Tutor T U T E U R. I also I'm on Facebook a fair amount. I know I should be on Instagram and Twitter or X or whatever it's called, but I, I just haven't quite gotten there yet. So LinkedIn I is think, where I spend most of my time. Yeah. Well, as being an author and business management consultant and executive coach, I think I think LinkedIn is pretty much where you need to be. X probably. Instagram here or there, when you start making videos, if you start making videos of the book, if you're doing, I'm, I'm sure your publicist or somebody can make like B-roll stuff with like little designs about your book and stuff. That would be cool. But other than that, I think you're in the right place. I think the people that will read your book are going to be on LinkedIn. I think that's where I think LinkedIn and Facebook. I really think that's where your audience is going to be. That's my, just my opinion. Just my opinion. And of course, you're doing podcasts. 
So we're good with that too. Just keep doing, just keep guesting on podcasts and getting people out, getting your name out there and stuff. So it's going to be great. So yeah, so Jonathan Tudor and Triple P Management Consulting and it's triple P L L C dot C O and the Facebook and LinkedIn. It'll all be in the show notes ready to go. And hopefully we're going to get a URL for the release of the book. We'll have that in there as well. And it's going to be, I, I can't wait to read it. I am so excited about it. So Jonathan, thank you. Thank you so much for this. This is fantastic. And what you've gone through and come out of is nothing short of amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. I really appreciate it. Uh, I, I, I appreciate you, my friend. So for myself and Jonathan, this is Life Changing Challengers, and we'll see you in the next one.